Okay, one sec. Charlie, it's yours. Take it away. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ray Mansbach for our next talk. Uh, Ray, please tell us about your living history. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Um, by the way, this is Scout. She came to say hi. So, <laughs> anyways, okay, girl, you're too heavy. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me here. Here is my obligatory, not actually a childhood photo, but it's a picture of me in undergrad that I found really fast, so it exists. Um, I am, hello, this is kind of my big picture slide of who the heck I am. It's like the number, the important bullet points that I think are sort of relevant to the way I think about myself. Uh, if I get distracted, my dog is still running around at my feet, sorry. Um, but I think these are some of the most important things about me. I'm I'm an author, I'm a friend, I'm queer, and I'm a scientist. And, and I have this thing where I said brain weird because I was going to say probably not neurotypical and definitely anxious, but there wasn't really room in that bullet point. Um, so this is kind of a bubble picture of me. And then I'm just going to kind of talk, I'm probably not going to talk as much about science. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am, which is in a, as an assistant professor of physics at Concordia in Montreal. Um, and it took me a while to get here, and it was kind of an interesting uh, journey. So I started, um, I did my high school education in the middle of the Midwest, where uh, everything, it was a university town, so everybody was very big on, you know, try really hard, uh, learn as much, as many things as possible all the time, which had pros and cons, like it was great that I was encouraged to learn, my parents are not physicists, and I ended up in physics anyways. Um, but at the same time, it can have some, there can be some uh, negative sides, including like tolls on your mental health. Uh, I went and did an undergrad. That's where the picture that I had on the other slide is from. Um, this was at, yeah, I, I know you're there, girl. Um, <laughs> this was at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, which is where my dad did his undergrad. It's a small liberal arts college which was really nice because I got, I almost minored in theater. I didn't quite, um, but I did a lot of theater and I did a lot of computer science and I did a lot of math and physics. Um, I had a little bit of undergraduate research and then I had no idea what I wanted to do with myself. So I applied to a bunch of different PhD programs in various different fields. Um, and I got accepted to several of them, um, including a physics program at Il the University of Illinois and also, um, the robotics PhD uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll go try this robotics thing. And this, uh, the program and I did not really mesh super well, uh, unfortunately. So I really didn't have a good time there and it just really wasn't working for me. And I spent, I, I, I really only toughed it out for one semester and then I was freaking out and I was like, oh, no, this is it. My career is over. You know, I, I can't do this. I'm doomed. Everything is at an end. I was rather over. I still am very overdramatic. But anyways, um, I didn't know what to do. And I was like, I want to go back to physics. I miss physics. And I had gotten, like I said, I had gotten into the University of Illinois. And finally, I was like, well, you know what? I turned them down, but maybe I could reapply or something. I called the head of graduate studies uh, at the University of Illinois sobbing from a parking garage in Pittsburgh uh, and was like, you know, what do I do? And he was just like, chill. You know, he takes time to comfort this sobbing, not even his student at that point. And was like, just chill. It's okay. You'll get back in. Just reapply. Everything will be fine. And he was right. So I went to the University of Illinois and I spent uh, some time TAing and I was super happy because I was back to physics. And then I spent a semester in a really lovely lab. This is uh, Professor Nadia Mason. She is fantastic. Um, but I also found out that I don't like doing experimental condensed matter because the machines scare me and they're too expensive. So I was like, okay, not the experimental condensed matter. Um, and I ended up changing labs to Andy Ferguson's group um, in computational biophysics. And I had really, really had a blast, a really great time. I am doing my PhD and I got to do a lot of work on sort of protein aggregation, short, small peptide aggregation, like glowy nanowires if I want to be exciting about it. It was really fun. And then I still didn't know what I wanted to do next. I was kind of, uh, I wasn't that confident in my research and I wasn't really sure if I wanted to keep doing research because I had a lot of imposter syndrome going on. And I was like, well, you know, I, I have confidence that I can teach, but I don't have confidence that my research is that good. So I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I was really lucky because I went to a conference in 2017 in Edinburgh, the thermodynamics conference. 
Um, and I got a prize to speak there because I applied for the prize because I wanted to go for the conference and it would pay for the conference and it was Edinburgh. So there wasn't really any way to get paid for it. Otherwise I got the prize, which was very exciting. I flew there and I was exhausted because there's a whatever time difference. Um, and then I wandered over to the conference center and I met two very important people at the conference. One of them was this delightful dog whose name I don't think I ever learned, but he was a very, very, very nice chap that I got to pet on the head. And the other one was my PhD advisor's PhD advisor, Thanos, who watched my talk and was like, that was amazing. That was super good. And asked me what I was going to do. And I was kind of hedgy. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to stay doing research. And he was like, you should. You're great. This is really cool work. You should keep going. You know, you should think about doing a research heavy position. And I was like, okay, you know what? If, you know, he doesn't know me. Yeah, he's my PhD advisor, PhD advisor, but he doesn't have to say nice things about me. So, you know, I'll give it a shot. I'll go and do a postdoc um, and then see where I end up. And so I went and did a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab, and I was doing a lot of work on sort of uh, antibiotics and also on like toxins, which I'm really excited. I'm getting to, getting back into toxins now. But then everything kind of screeched to a halt <laughs> um, because all of a sudden, you know, I, I had actually signed my offer letter from Concordia. So I just applied to a few places uh, just to see what happened. And I got lucky um, because the school matched my interest very well and the position completely matched everything I was looking for. And I had just signed the offer letter and then everything shut down because it was pandemic. And all of a sudden, instead of finishing up my nice paper on toxins, I was spending all of my time glued to my desk in my bedroom doing simulations on the spike protein um, and finding out that you can get away with using 100 times as much compute time as you're supposed to as long as you don't tell anyone you're doing it until after you've already done it. So uh, yeah, surprise, surprise, you can burn through a lot of resources very quickly. Um, I don't recommend this unless you are working on an important problem. We were working on a pretty important problem because I was working in the theoretical biology and biophysics group. And so we were actually simulating um, the D614G mutation of the spike protein, and we were able to show uh, that the reason that this mutation was happening essentially was that there was an increased uh, likelihood of getting, uh, of, of being in the, basically being in the confirmation that made it easier to get into the cell. So that was a really cool moment to be working at Los Alamos because I was working down the hall for an immunologist, right? While I'm doing the molecular dynamic simulations for the immunologist. And I was on a fellowship, so I was actually able to pivot and look at this really quickly. But it was also absolutely freaking terrifying. Um, and just, I mean, I'm sure it was terrifying for everybody, right? Um, but at the, at the same time, we we're trying to do an international move. So I did not do any of that. That was basically my spouse. My spouse did all the paperwork, all the arrangements, everything to get us from Los Alamos to Montreal, which was absolutely freaking ridiculous. Um, this is my, you know, my, my, my advice is don't start a faculty position during a global pandemic. Okay. We drove for three days straight and got here that quickly. And the only reason I got through it was by comparing my experiences to the characters in Tolkien and all of the bad things that happened to them. And I was like, well, it's not that bad. So obviously I'm, I'm doing better. Okay, cool. Um, so that's nice. Now I'm working here and I'm finally back. I'm finally in person, which is really exciting. It's only been about a year and a half, really. Um, I have a couple of extra slides that I'm just going to zoom through really fast. But, um, if people are interested, I, you can get a hold of me, but basically I have this incredibly long list, incomplete list of things I have screwed up because I always think it's really important to be like, Hey, look at all of the things that I didn't know or didn't do right. And all of the things that I didn't get, uh, all of the grants that I didn't get, this isn't all of them, I don't think, but I haven't even been doing grants for that many years, but I have this scrolling list of things that I didn't get. Um, and this is sort of me saying, well, look, um, I'm bringing this up because how many of us have imposter syndrome, maladaptive perfectionism, catastrophic thinking that affects so many people, especially people who are minor minoritized in STEM, but even you know anybody, really lots and lots of people um not fun something that you just kind of have to handle and so I have this slide that I, it kind of sounds a little bit hokey but I think it's 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 something that I have to tell myself a lot is that I am a person with worth outside of my work and so I'm happy to chat about my work but I'm also happy to chat about other things that aren't my work right um and I have a bunch of coping mechanisms and my favorite uh my favorite image from Ali Brosh which is maybe everything isn't hopeless bullshit 
Um, but you know, everybody has to find their own coping mechanisms. And I think the best advice I ever got was ignore advice that isn't right for you. That was from one of the engineering professors at Urbana, uh, Urbana Champaign. Um, and then I have just kind of this scrolling list again of sort of coping mechanisms that I have um, and that work for me, but they might work differently for other people. Um, I have a lab, it is full of amazing people, and we think that it is really important to try to solve problems of diversity in physics. So I throw the slide into everything because my lab poster, and I want to remind myself that I'm trying to, you know, work with other folks to figure out ways to solve problems involving scientists and not just science. Um, and then finally, because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to throw up a, a bunch of, of people's faces. Um, because just to show, right, normally you have like uh, not that many acknowledgements, but I was like, look, there's, there's a lot of people who've helped me out here, right? This is, this is the dream team that is behind me being where I am. And this is incomplete as well, but yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ray. I'm, um, applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, so uh, I'll start out with a, a question for you. Um, so you, know, you, you, know, you were describing some of these feelings of imposter syndrome and how you've developed these coping mechanisms. Um, and I was curious to hear more about how you learned what the coping mechanisms were that worked best for you. And then second part, how do you um, pass this on to students that you're teaching and mentoring? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of trial and error. Uh, a lot of trial and error, and I'm also fortunate that I have many friends outside of academe, um, and I think that that's been very important for me, is finding communities and forming friendships and networks outside of academe, because you see different coping mechanisms and different pro like sort of brain problems from different points of view. So I've been fortunate that I've had a lot of friends just be like, Ray, you, you need to not do this. You need to not work all the time. Um, I've had great therapists who've also helped with this a lot. And I spend a lot of time trying to do stuff like meditation, which is really helpful for me and also kind of helps me think about what are good coping mechanisms. Uh, how do I pass this on to students? Uh, to be honest, I give them the slide and, I, you know, and I, I will talk about things like this slide. And I try to be really open about the stuff that I'm interested in, just just to sort of connect with folks. Um, I have I have told everyone for the last three or four months who is interested about how my D and D party got stranded in the astral plane, right? Stuff like that. Um, so I just try to make sure that people know that it's okay to experiment, that it's okay to not have all the answers. Um, and that, you know, I don't have all the answers, but these are some of the things that work for me. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and 